Hello, and thank you for coming to tonight's Friday Night Live program on the 2021 Student Exhibition. I'm Kara Conklin Wingfield. I'm Education Director here at the Parish Art Museum. And this year's year round Friday night programs are made possible by the generosity of our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, and with additional support from Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. We're going to begin today with a short video tour, which was filmed and edited by my colleague, Victor Miranda. This will give you a look inside the galleries. And after the video, I'll be joined by five teachers who contributed to the exhibition. So let's go right into the video now. Welcome to the 2021 Student Exhibition at the Parish Art Museum. I'm Kara Conklin-Wingfield and I direct the museum's education department. And each year we have the pleasure of coordinating and mounting a student exhibition. This tradition has been going on for over 60 years and it's a testament to the creativity of local students and the dedication of their art teachers. This year, despite significant challenges and changes to their daily practice, more than 30 art teachers are participated in the exhibition. We're really grateful to them for giving us all and the community something to look forward to. So let's take a closer look. Schools can participate in the exhibition by submitting group pieces from pre-K through grade eight, and also individual works from grades seven through 12. This gallery contains examples of collaborative projects that span the age range. These first two are from the Gary D. D. Bixborn Technical Center, which is um, a school where advanced students go to explore vocations in the visual arts. Both of these pieces show a scene broken down into a grid and students working in different media on individual panels. This one's a landscape scene and this one's a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. called Faces of a Leader. You can see they used pencil, charcoal, as well as some paint. This is another example of a grid with students each contributing a separate square. This one's painted in acrylic, is made by Southampton High School, and is also a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. It's called His Spirit Lives On. This piece is from Kachag East Elementary School. It's made by children from kindergarten through grade six. Here, the teacher came up with a really engaging way to explore the element of color, which one is one of the basic parts of the uh, elementary school art curriculum. So children brought in toys from home, and then they worked together to assemble them into a color wheel, and explore the relationships between colors. This year, teachers worked with um, a lot of different digital tools to engage children, whether they might be at home or in the classroom. This is a piece from Tuckahoe Common School made by the first and second graders where they explored the art of Pete Mondrian and also looked at how his work 
related to urban maps. And in this case, each square was contributed by a separate student that was put together into a digital mural and printed out on canvas. This gallery contains group as well as individual works from children from pre-K up to grade seven. And I'm just gonna point out a few themes. One of them is the inventive use of materials. Three pieces here all use yarn. This one from Sag Harbor Elementary School is based on a study of the Mexican yarn paintings of the Wicol people. Children created scenes that they glued down so scenes made with yarn. This piece from West Hampton Beach Elementary School looks at a more contemporary use of yarn by artists who do what's called yarn bombing. It's kind of a, a graffiti or public art uh, experience that where artists cover trees or objects outdoors with yarn. They created this piece. Each student learned to knit and created one part of the quilt and it's on view here, uh, kind of draped over a form, but afterwards it'll go back to the students' community to kind of find its new home somewhere on public view. And then one more piece using yarn is also from Sag Harbor Elementary School. This piece uses um, the rug hooking technique which you may be familiar with, but also um, comes out of a traditional uh, practice from the um, uh, North American colonies where uh, settlers made rugs out of scraps of yarn. And it seems fitting that Sag Harbor Elementary School should use that tradition, uh, a seaside craft to make what's called a compass that says, may your heart be your compass when you're lost. One of the other themes in the exhibition is inspiration from nature, whether it be animals, plants, or the four seasons. Here's a few great examples. These pieces were made by the Flora and Fauna School. It's a forest school on the North Fork. Children spend a lot of time outdoors and they gather material from the landscape. This piece is inspired by a poem by Emily Dickinson called Hope is a Thing with Feathers. Here's another example from Southampton Montessori School. These children looked out the windows of the school and saw the birds busy in the landscape in winter. They created birds and they also sponge painted pots and flowers here to make this assembly. And it's accompanied by a quote from J.M. Barry, who's the author of the Peter Pan books. The quote is, I'm youth, I'm joy, I'm a little bird that is broken out of the egg. And over here, we have a school-wide piece from Rainer Country Day School. It's called the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is uh, symbolic of the interconnectedness of all things. And it's also an organizing principle in biology. And a lot of times art teachers work to bring learning from discipline, different disciplines together. And I think it's also very fitting for a project that brought together a whole school. The remaining galleries are devoted to individual work by high school students. And here you'll see a whole range of advanced study doing exercises like drawing from observation, uh, portraiture and self-portraiture, and a whole variety of media. There's more than 14 different schools represented, and I'm gonna point out just a handful of examples.
Over here is a unique piece by a student from East Hampton High School. It's a topographical model of a landscape and a dock design. It looks like a question mark from above, which makes me think that maybe there's a little bit more going on. Over here is a large painting by a student from William Floyd High School. It shows evidence of a developing personal style. It's called For Mom. On this wall is a selection of work from Southampton High School. Like each high school, it shows a variety of media, from painting, digital work, and drawing. And I just want to point out this one watercolor. It's called No Goodbyes. And it shows a really sensitive use of the media, having um, the layering and light and shadow. There are more than 200 individual works on view in these galleries by high school students, and I urge you to come and have a closer look. You can visit the museum in person. The exhibition is on view through April 18th, or we're going to have a 360 degree virtual tour available on the museum's website. So go to parishart.org for details on visiting and to see that tour. In closing, I want to thank the teachers, parents, and school administrators who made this effort possible, and also the support we received from all members of the museum and the financial supporters of the parish and its education programs. That was fun. So as I said in the video, the success of this exhibition is fully dependent on the art teachers who choose to take on the additional work of developing and preparing student art for display. And I'm joined now by five teachers who have been involved in the museum in various ways, including serving on our education advisory committee, participating in uh, residency programs, teaching workshops at the museum, and leading professional development programs for other educators at the museum. They're all very committed to teaching to their students and to their communities. And they are Dina Rose of Manitouk Junior Senior High School, Heather Evans, Unified Arts Department Coordinator of East Hampton School District, Pamela Collins of Southampton High School, Meg Mandel of Sag Harbor Elementary School, and Robin Guianas of Bridgehampton School. Did I get everybody? Thank you all for coming, for joining tonight for this discussion. This is the group I looked to for advice back in the fall when the parish began to plan for this exhibition. And they told me that it was a difficult year, um, but they felt that it was important to do this exhibit and it would give the, the children and the community something to look forward to. So before I begin the um, before we begin the discussion, I just want to remind our attendees 
that if you want to interact with the panelists, please do that through the chat feature. We'll have a look at any comments and questions in there. That's at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. We'll have a look at that toward the end of the discussion. So the first question I have for, for all of you is, I think um, everyone has heard about the modifications that uh, school districts have to, have to make after reopening um, this year. And I think the public might know less about the modifications required of art teachers. So I'm curious what if you could share the challenges and changes you're navigating this year and why despite all of those challenges, you felt it was important to, um, to participate in this exhibition. So let's start with, um, with Robin. Should have told you the order. Robin, just unmute yourself. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, well, the challenges have been unbelievable. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I think the first thing that that comes to my mind is that it has really been about finding new ways to do everything. Um, I don't know what the situation of all the other um, art teachers has been, but for me, um, I was told that I wasn't going to have an art room when I went back to school, that my room was no longer going to be available. Um, I was able to salvage it for a while in the end, and I teach three classes in the room now. Um, but all the, all the periods where I don't teach in my room, somebody else is teaching in it. So um, I don't have access to the preparation. I don't have access to, um, I have access, but not during the school day. So I was accustomed to doing my prep and, and organizing uh, sort of as I went. And I think that's been the most challenging thing for me is the space and moving around and carrying things from room to room and keeping everything clean. For me, that's been, that's been, you know, it's been a real challenge. Very difficult. Everything's different now. <laughs> and despite that, you, I think you have six or seven group pieces in the, mm -hmm. um, in the exhibition because Robin at the Bridgehampton school, mm -hmm. are you teaching pre-K through 12? I'm teaching K, K through, K 12, through 12, but not, not pre-K. Um, so, so we, so we were able to pull together some things, not our usual amount and, um, and nothing that would have, you know, really nothing that was really going to be messy. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we've had is getting work, um, actual physical work into the school um, is, has become almost impossible. So the students that have come back now are, are in school and I, and I can collect physical work, but the ones that are at home, many of them, they don't come in, they don't, they don't deliver work. Uh, they send me photographs. So I don't have the physical work that I once had. And, um, and I'm kind of a physical art teacher. So it's been challenging to find new ways to do things. And, um, We've all learned a lot of new technology and, um, and that's good. It's good. Um, it hasn't cooperated very well most of the time. That's, that's challenging. So it's been very tricky. It's been really tricky. I think everybody's working really hard and they're really not sure if they're doing the right thing. It's, it's, been, um, it's been a really interesting year, but it's important you know, to keep going. Meg, why don't you tell us about your experiences at Sag Harbor Elementary? Okay, um, I also lost my art room, but I was used to it because I taught for 11 years um, art on a cart. So I, the last seven years I had an art room. So I, was, I went back to my how it began in Sag Harbor. And so we, I think they're doing a great job keeping kids safe. And that's really the number one thing. Um, we're spread out. There's 12 students in every classroom, six feet apart. For me, teaching, the actual teaching is very difficult because you can't get close to a child. Usually I would have them on the rug in my art room where we'd all sit around 
the circle and I'd work on the floor and give a demonstration where you can't get that close anymore. So it might be me videotaping myself and then showing that on the screen um, or walking around, you know. Uh, I find I use technology so much now, which I never did before. So that is a benefit, but also I was of the, of the thought where let's turn off the computers and keep our, you know, get our hands dirty. So I guess I am balancing that. Um, the way it works out though with the kids, I see every student, um, we don't have kindergarten in the building. So first through fifth, I that's the age level I teach. And it's every day, first through fifth. So every class. I see them for a full week and then I don't see them for six more weeks. I see the next group of, of students, the cohorts, they call them. So that's tricky, especially putting together an art show. I'm starting, I have to think about how long will it take? Definitely two weeks. So we started, you know, right after Christmas, which I was glad I talked to you about that because I'm like, are we still having the show because <laughs> I'm going to put a lot of work into this, a lot of time. Um, and why would I do it? Oh my goodness, the tradition I love. This is the best time of year. And I'm so proud of my students to have art in a real gallery, real beautiful museum. So I think it's just such an opportunity for the children to be able to have their work in such a special place. That's why I do it. It was a lot of work. And if you said it was, it couldn't happen, I, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have cried about it, but um, I'm glad that, you know, after we went for it, um, you know, I'm really proud of, of the results. At the museum, we really wanted to do it, but we didn't want to create more stress for anyone. And I remember, Meg, when I reached out to you, basically you said, I have to start next week because of that schedule. Yes. And that wouldn't have normally been the case, obviously, no. in the, early in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. So Pam, how about um, you share what's, how's it going in Southampton High School? Uh, it's going surprisingly well. I'm very pleased with the artwork that I'm getting uh, from my students. Um, the tricky part is navigating the technology and the planning, and then also allowing there to be some sponta spontaneity in there. Um, I have to plan my lessons like, you know, at least a month in advance. I'm filming lessons that the students are going to do in a month. Um, just because we work from digital activity lists, um, which are awesome, but they take a long time to create. And um, so I find myself really having to see into the future way more than ever before. Um, but I found that my students are really um, returning the work and that they have a very rich experience. And um, despite the rigidity of the planning that I have to do, um, you know, the creativity is still there. Um, and I found that it's, it's so important to do the art show uh, at the Parish Museum despite everything because art perseveres uh, through very, very hard times. And um, if this is the lesson that I can give my students, I think this is the best way to do it. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's so true that breakthroughs in art often come um, after periods of like um, worldwide hardship. It's very true. So Heather Evans, how about um, at East Hampton schools? Well, it's been um, really validating to hear the stories from Robin and Meg and Pam. Um, I can give you a picture of um, the teachers in the different uh, school districts, as well as um, a, uh, my own personal experience as a teacher as well. And in John Marshall, um, our teacher, uh, Dawn Diamond, who teaches the elementary students, um, she also is not in her classroom. So that affects, as Robin um, noted, it affects her ability to prep. Uh, Dawn always brought a, a very um, creative approach to working with clay, especially um, to our school exhibits. So this year that's not possible because she's, she's going to the students. Um, she does have some access to her room, but, but um, not what she's used to um, and has still managed to get a lot of work 
from the students. Um, in terms of the middle school, I spoke with uh, Brian and just get a little bit of a picture of some of the things he's been dealing with at the, at the elementary school. He does have his classroom. Uh, a lot of his work is with students that are working from home and working virtually. Um, one of the projects he worked with was um, kind of tied in with a school-wide initiative called Knowledge is Power, and we might talk about it a little bit later. Um, but the main uh, theme, and it's something that kind of comes to us high school teacher, art teachers, is the idea of trying to maintain some type of continuity um, despite these, this kind of abstract vacuum of time that kind of goes in and out. There's um, trying to maintain the continuity, trying to maintain the conversation and the context of everything that we're doing with the students. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with my students is that there's this, this weird thing of time. Um, in some cases, students are working more at home. Uh, so there's the challenge of making sure that there's equity in terms of getting materials um, and having access to that. Uh, but when students are working from home, some students um, are able to kind of get lost in a in a positive way in terms of working um, uninterrupted and really getting more involved. And in some cases, some of their artwork, and uh, I'm talking on the high school level, seems to me to be even more personal. The conversations are not as often in terms of back and forth, but um, sometimes their work is a little bit more personal and um, more involved in a different kind of way. And uh, one other thing I do wanna say though, I was very glad uh, that you reached out and asked if you were going to have, uh, if, if you thought this was a good idea to have an exhibit because it was it's sort of like a relief for myself as a teacher that things will go on. You know, there is, um, some normalcy that we can share with ourselves, our colleagues and our students in terms of these exhibitions. Yes, they're harder, but you know, we can do hard things. We can do this and um, it's, it's a bright spot of light in some shadowy areas <laughs> that we're getting with. Definitely. I felt very moved that we were able to do this um, when Parents, the people I know, especially with young children, they have um, so few ways to celebrate what their children are doing or engage with what their children are doing in the school setting. Um, mm -hmm. So they can't go to a concert or see work on view in the hallway because they can't enter the building. So it was, um, there, it became, it took on greater meaning than even other years, I felt like. So, Dina. How are things in, um, in Maritok? Well, um, I agree with everything everyone has said so far, but one word comes to my mind when thinking about the challenges of the school year and the beginning of the, you know, at home learning is adaptability. Um, the closure of the schools and the shifting from classrooms to online teaching was definitely a challenge that we all had to rapidly adapt to. Um, we also encountered significant challenges. I mean, adapting to new programs and technology took some time to work out all the kinks. Um, some students had no space at home and no materials or limited use of materials. Um, and technology was another hurdle since most of us normally use traditional supplies that were not readily available in most students' homes. Um, I think as educators, we had to rapidly adapt to that remote working and, and meet a new set of demands that was being placed on us. And um, in, in my department, uh, we sent out bags of supplies to students that could be used with multiple lessons. And we were mindful with our planning and making sure we carefully considered limitations experienced by some of the students. Um, I feel that now um, as teachers need uh, to model, as teachers, we need to model the flexibility, creativity, and positivity, reflection, um, 
we need to show students how in times of crisis, we can provide a worthwhile um, remote curriculum to support them in all aspects of learning and to help them find positive and um, compassionate ways forward. Um, I mean, these last few months have highlighted how important it is as we forge a meaningful art curriculum and nurture the young artists. And the Parish Art Museum is such an important part of the art community and gives our students an opportunity to exhibit artwork in a prestigious museum. I mean, every year, uh, students from grades K to 12 in my building look, <clears throat> look forward to the Parish Art exhibit. Um, I mean, this year posed many restric restrictions and uh, lack of events and programs being offered and having you know, the Parish Art Museum extended this, uh, you know, opportunity that's so important to many young artists that were participating. Um, and I really would like to thank every, everyone at the museum for working so hard to make this happen. Um, I was excited to hear that we were actually the first exhibit at the parish since the shutdown. So it really was a special year. And again, it did create a little bit more normalcy and excitement to see that you opened for us. And there was definitely some hurdles and challenges, but we all forged forward and it really was you know exciting and important to the students and the families and the community so um thank you for everything you've all done it was really great the student exhibition actually is like a bookmark to the pandemic year because we had just opened it when um the um the state mandated shutdown of all non-essential businesses went into place it had only been open in 2020 for about uh, four or five days. And then the museum did open actually from August through early January. And we closed again when um, there was a sur the surge going on and then we're able to reopen with the student exhibition. So the next part, um, I've asked the teachers to tell us a little bit more about the work they submitted to the exhibit. So we have some um, images to accompany this part of the talk. Here they are. This is an introductory image. Uh, the museum reopened today to members. Um, it's open today and tomorrow for museum members. And then on the Sunday, the 14th, opens to the public. Uh, but this past weekend, we had a preview just for exhibiting artists and teachers. And um, over the course of that weekend, even with the limited capacity and timed entry, we had, we were, we welcomed more than 400 people. So that was really um, joyous and evident that um, uh, the participants were eager to come and experience the work in person. So if we could go to the next slide, Victor. We'll go in order of appearance here. So this one's from uh, McNandell. Do you want me to talk? Yeah, say a little bit more about what, what you did here and why. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think you, as art teachers, we need to be inspired ourselves because we're putting so many hours in. So I was, last year I was with my girlfriends from high school and we were in the city and one of my high school girlfriends, um, uh, her husband, David Kramer is an artist and we were at a show that he was having and he does latch hook. So he creates um, paintings and mixed media and he also does latch hook um, rugs in his work. So I was, I thought that was so cool. And I said, well, I was feeling it and the text, the wonderful feel of it. And I said, oh, the kids would love this. So I asked him about it. What, what does it take? He uses a crochet hook and he uses burlap. I tried it way too hard for children, especially fourth and fifth grade. So um, I tried the traditional way with the latch hook. And um, when I was a little kid, I used to do it. And so um, that's what I decided to do. Now the compass rose, um, I, it's in the hallways with the students are learning in, in their curriculum um, when they were making maps with uh, social studies and unit. Um, so that was something that was visible. And I said, oh, um, I love that compass. I have a necklace that I, when my daughter moved away, I have two daughters, I gave us, we all have the same necklace and it has a little compass on it. So it means something to me. And then um, also we, we're in the nautical town, Sag Harbor. And lastly, um, country fan and Lady A, Lady Interbellum, there's a song, may your heart be your compass when you're lost. And I really think that's a really great saying for this year because so many of ki kids are feeling lost and even just working in this medium is very relaxing, very therapeutic. 
I think um, we all need art therapy in, in our lives. So um, I, when you were talking about the grid, um, this is this is the, let's see, I can't really see with my background, but I have a grid that same as the idea of the hallway art is each kid received a piece of the canvas and it was had a dark side and a light side. So we had discussed pointillism early in the year and I talked about you know how colors combine and this works really well with that concept. So one side had to be contrasted with the other. Some students worked really diligently, making sure it was perfect. Others, maybe random colors. And, um, you know, I think it came together really well. They had a lot of freedom. Some brought it home. I had some students that maybe could only do a letter, their capabilities, but, and they, but they participated. And others maybe did three pieces of the compass rose. They were so into it. So it was a tricky to get it all put together at the end, but I couldn't believe how nice it looked on the wall. You guys did a great job putting that up. And um, yeah, the kids have, everyone received their own latch hook. Uh, Mr. Malone, my principal, made sure they all have their own and they have the yarn at home. So if, if they wanna do this on their own, they are gonna do that. And we do have students remote as well. And it's a great remote lesson. Um, you know, all you have to do is learn how and, and go from there and you can create your own picture and, and make your own uh, rug or pillow or whatever you wanna make. It's really fun. And the installation also includes some images of, um, of your students at work. Yeah, it is all about the process. And um, so, I, you know, it is my photo photographs, but I did want to show what it takes to put it together. Some kids like to work on the floor, some work, you know, that they copy each other. So what, what color are we doing now? And they make sure they're matching. Um, but yeah, they all did, did a great job on them. Thanks, Meg. I think the next image is from Robin. Yes. Whoops, you have to unmute yourself. I can unmute myself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So this this piece actually is um, is my this is my bookmark from a year ago because this was the last thing that um, some of my younger students, because I, I, I teach K through 12, some of my younger students completed and with the promise that we were going to, <laughs> we were going to, um, you know, try to exhibit it. And so when I came back this year, I, I thought about, um, you know, I, I wanted to show new things that we had created during this school year, but I had this, this that was still sitting there and the kids that I still have would ask me what where are our sun faces what happened to our sun faces and I said I'm holding on to them for something really special so this was the something really special and it is something really special this tradition is it's a beautiful tradition it's a um, a magnificent you know world-class museum right in our backyard and um, um, the parish has always made it very, very comfortable for our students to be a part of the museum because um, we've had a lot of partnerships, mostly with the older kids, but with all the, all the students. And so this, this just is, is um, a little representative of, I would say, hope and what could be on you know, the other side of you know, getting through this this year. And, and, and it also is really a real bookmark. It was like the last, the last thing that, that, that I completed the last time that I fired the kiln, um, you know, and I'm a ceramic artist and ceramics is my, is my, is my, uh, my favorite um, medium. And so it is also my favorite medium to teach. So um, I look forward to the inspiration that it gives me and that it, I feel it gives my students. And so, it's happiness and hope there. Victor, could you go to the next image? And this one, this is a this is a, a mix of many different ages. And this was um, just a, um, a study on um, Picasso style faces. And um, I did this with several classes and probably had about three times as many students do this project as we have here. Um, but these were the only ones that I got back. 
um, that I actually got physically in my hand. So I put them all together, even though they were a mix of grades. And um, just to sort of show a, a mosaic of different, different styles, different lines. Some of them have a lot of emotion. Some of them are, are more um, linear and, and, and geometric in design. Um, they're all, they all kind of look like they're looking out from behind bars or cracked glass or something like as if they're behind, as if they're, as if they're, they're, they're being held back by something a little bit, which I think makes it kind of interesting. Um, because that's what comes through to me, even though I don't know if they intended it to be so. Um, it's like, they're all like, um, when are you going to let me out of here? <laughs> and, um, it has a little bit of that feeling to me. So um, I thought that it was, um, and, and in different media, because my students, you know, especially when they were working at home, um, we, you know, they, we didn't supply them with supplies. They, they, they had what they had. And, um, and then when they came back, um, I wasn't, we didn't have the, the funding to order new supplies. So um, we're working on, we're working on, whatever we have, which is, you know, we're trying to use everything best that we can right now. We're still getting some pretty interesting things. Definitely. I think the next image is from Dina. This is the um, wall of the high school work from Mattituck Junior Senior High School. And the next image, Okay, um, so this particular work uh, created a lot of discussion amongst my students, um, which was created by uh, Leah Shorter, and she called it Social Puffs. And one thing that started off the conversation is how when children are young, they gravitate to those cereal boxes with characters and all the different colors and you know, messages that are coming through on what cereal they would like. Um, and her twist on this was the social media aspect. And we started this project as a social political piece that they had to research uh, something that was going on currently. And she picked up on social media and technology. Um, and the students had very different views on technology and its positive and negative aspects on their generation. Um, she, she, Aaliyah created this piece with the idea of a younger generation that is addicted to social media and ultimately is constantly living in a digital world rather than in the moment. Um, they also discussed the isolation from COVID-19 um, and how it only increased the consumption of social media and technology, hence why she wrote more on the bowl and the continuing flow of all the little pieces of cereal that she made the different icons of social media. And the students said at times technology was unavoidable uh, since that was the only way to communicate while being isolated at home. So, it really was an interesting conversation had by my students as you know different works were put up around the building or they saw them on slideshows. And this one really seemed to be relevant and stir a lot of interesting you know, conversation and thoughts from them. So that's why I chose to highlight Aaliyah's piece because it really struck a, a note with everybody in my classes, whether it was junior high to high school, because I'm a seven through 12 teacher. So um, I wanted to highlight her piece for that and commend her for that you know, message that it was very controversial and interesting to talk about. Thank you. Definitely, that's an issue we were all thinking about. Parents especially, I think. And the next images are from um, Pam Collins students and um, Daniela Ozzi at uh, Southampton High School. And I think the next image is of the, the mural. Um, this is our uh, group project um, uh, uh, about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. 
um, the East End Arts Council had a um, project, school school wide project for schools to create um, portraits of Martin Luther King Jr. And um, this was a great assignment for my mural and set design class um, because it provided us to create a collective piece, um, but still stay socially distanced. Um, and my students created all of these uh, uh, squares at home and they each got assigned one square and um, transferred the image to the canvas and painted it in. Um, and they were able to take a lot of creative uh, liberties with their patterns and textures and designs and colors. Um, and there's also another uh, version of this that is currently at the East End Arts um, Council gallery show. Um, and I had so many students in both of my mural and set design classes that we had to create two, um, which is awesome because um, that, that class is growing, which is great. I have more students in it this year than last year because it's a new course. And um, also in times like this, it's I feel like I'm really trying to find um, artwork and 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 students to create it and here I've had uh, you know almost too many that we were able to create too so um, this one is going to have find a permanent home at our high school so uh, and then this is a piece by uh, my senior student Cynthia Lynn um, and it's called no more goodbyes and I decided to talk about this piece um, because it just, in this time, it just reminds us all that like, maybe the, the time you say goodbye, it, it could be the last time that you say goodbye to the person. Um, it's just, uh, life is so precious now and um, saying goodbye is so hard uh, as we don't necessarily know the future. Um, also physically, we've all been very separated that, um, Goodbye is very, very hard. Uh, and I think this piece just represents that. But I feel like in her eyes, there is hope that um, that we will all be together again. And um, I always tell my students, it's not goodbye, I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I feel like that, that the eyes give me hope, the tears in them. So. Yeah, it's a very touching image with that yeah. sense of that there's a doorway or a person outside the outside of the image. Yeah. The next set of images are from um, East Hampton School District. And uh, yes, I asked um, you to share this image just to um, point out the multitude. This is about a fifth or a sixth of the amount of work that um, Dawn Diamond has been able to generate from all the students that she's in contact with on a cart in, at John Marshall Elementary. Um, so these are the flowers, the vibrant flowers, hope for spring uh, of the, um, I believe it's the kindergarten um, level group and it's just a it's just a selection of many that they that she has done with the students and uh, this is uh, from our art teacher at the middle school Brian DeAndrea this is the uh, knowledge is power um, piece that I referenced earlier um, Brian wrote me a note about it just to clarify he said this was the theme from the middle school for the school year knowledge is power and when he's working with the kids um, they were talking about illustrating some of the things that they know or have knowledge about um, not just as a personal description but um, the work that the students created is a result of the conversations that he's had with them about being informed during the pandemic and um, other global issues. One of the things they talk about is being aware, um, just being aware, um, and that that's the first step to good decision-making and choices. 
And these two pieces are from uh, Margaret uh, Zuberian's drawing classes. And in these classes, um, she was working with the students discussing how they can document this, our time, this current time in history through portraits. And one of the things they thought, thought discussed or talked about was expressing through their eyes. And um, what came up through the class conversations, hybrid, um, a lot of it virtual. So these, and these drawings I know because I saw um, at, were worked on at home um, because I saw Margaret making the kits for them to take these home. They're about, they're 18 by 24 uh, inches. Um, the masks, each of the masks that are in these self portraits have a different um, sense of normalcy in a way. Uh, the work on the left by Dylan Islami uh, represents a mask that he wears, he paints cars. <laughs> um, so he has to wear a very uh, heavy duty mask regardless of whether it's a pandemic or not. And on the right is Kira Atwell's um, beautifully rendered portrait which makes her mask appear to be a normal accessory. So um, I just thought those were some interesting um, things to share. This piece is uh, from one of my students. This is Amanda Crea. She's a senior and she's an advanced placement uh, student. And she's working on her sustained investigation topic which focuses on movement and repetition. And she had been working with uh, repetition of human form. But some of the uh, resources for her imagery um, was getting a little uh, generalized. So we were talking about how can she make this more personal? And the pieces, I'm, I'm referring to this as pieces because it's actually three panels. She took the panels home and, and this would be an example of an extensive amount of uninterrupted time where she began to do a lot of exploring on how she could use herself um, an imagery of herself, but create a, a, like a repetition, a mantra from it. So she actually, she described to me, and when she brought these in, um, she was describing to me the process. This is a collage and a painting um, and lots of different uh, materials that are layered on with each other. She said that she would um, take photographs of herself and her hands, which are on the right-hand side, and she would pull them up on the screen on her Chromebook, which is what every student has, and then uh, use that screen of the Chromebook as a light box. And then she would trace the uh, imagery and get multiple um, elements that she could collage and then paint onto. So she, um, this is one of the examples of how that extended time or the unusual context that things are being created, create new solutions. These two pieces uh, on the left is uh, another advanced placement student in Sheila Batiste's uh, photography class. And um, the painting on the right is a student in my drawing and painting level two class. And they both represent um, another uh, development from this new situation in that students, um, and again, within the context of time, seem to have more time to connect with their immediate surroundings. So Sheila's um, students were going on discovery walks in nature and constructing compositions based on those experiences. And uh, the painting on the right, uh, the painting on the, I mean, the. Uh, let me just circle back. Uh, the photographer, I wanna give her credit. The photographer is Lauren Gabbard um, as the AP photography student. And on the right, the painting is by Kimberly Bermeo, who is a junior, Lauren is a senior. Um, Kimberly's painting is uh, from a photograph of a marina in Springs. 
and at an unusual, again, that idea of time is coming up, an unusual moment of time that we may not have typically addressed if we were in a regular time uh, doing these assignments. And um, I asked this piece to be shared simply as a, a way to make a comment on um, some of the challenges I was dealing with in terms of unexpected uh, times where we would say, okay, I'll, next couple of days you're going to be uh, virtual, you know, and it was sort of shifts had to be made in approaches. So the postcard series. Um, most of the postcards in this collaboration, and it's a grouping of several different levels of classes, uh, drawing one class, a drawing two class, a uh, advanced level drawing class, and an AP class, um, represent mostly um, experimentations with different media in depicting landscapes. And the landscapes also come from uh, local, photography. Um, and what we did when we were virtual is explore color analysis through digital mosaic drawings. So taking a photograph and reconstructing it in Google Draw um, and in mosaic format, and then using that color analysis to experiment with different materials such as acrylic paint, watercolor, collage, oil pastel, and such. And the idea being these smaller pieces are uh, transportable, they fit in a manila folder, and um, it opens up opportunity for experimentation for a future larger project. And they're displayed with the traditional little corners because we do want them to be postcards. We want to uh, mail them out after they've uh, been on display. Interacting with um, some of the landscapes are some figural pieces from a, uh, another advanced placement student who's exploring texture uh, and figures in the environment. So those are integrated together in this collaboration. It's fascinating to hear how this disruption in schedules and practices led to led, leads to so many challenges, but there also were opportunities. Well, all of you found really creative solutions, but there also were these unexpected opportunities, like for students to explore their environment more or to engage with materials you might not have um, considered. And before we um, we close, I just want to mention this is an image of what our um, 360 virtual tour looks like. So I wanna encourage everyone to have a look at that through the museum's website um, and, and come in person if you can. And um, we do have one question in the chat that I, I wanna bring up, which is um, quite a few of you mentioned um, the use of technology and just now Heather mentioned Google Draw, but are there any other specific uh, tools you've been using that um, are new this year? And um, might you continue using them um, even after the kind of restrictions and practices are lifted? And um, anybody who wants um, can chime in. Go ahead, Pam. We've been Zooming all the time with our classes. And um, I felt like once we regularly Zoomed with our students, um, our, my connection with them got stronger. And I was able to put a face to the name of the remote student. And um, we've even led demonstrations, like I was demonstrating sewing the other day on Zoom. I had my camera pointing down and just uh, showing them some stitching. and. Um, we led critiques during Zoom uh, on Zoom with students present in the classroom and students remote. So I just find that there are no more walls on the classroom because Zoom has opened all the walls and doors. So great. <laughs> Go ahead. So um, we use Google Classroom that I never 
since last year when we went remote, we started using Google Classroom. And so it's great because if a kid's out, even if they're just out sick, normal sickness, um, they can go to Google Classroom and see what we're doing. Um, we can have this child join um, using a Meet link. We use Meet. And I think it's great for us to have it all in there. So when we, you know, next year we can go back and we have all our lessons and all the pictures and, and examples. It's, it's a nice um, way to keep things in file. We can go back and look at all the artwork we've submitted throughout the year and see how much growth we've had. So I will continue to um, use the Google Classroom. Dina? Um, we also do use the Google Classroom, which seems to work seamlessly with many things. Um, if there's any other art educators out there watching, I wanted to just mention that New York State Art Teachers Association, we did have a virtual conference that is a like a huge source of um, information and resources based on your level of teaching or your subject uh, or discipline in art. So I highly recommend tapping into that if you need information or help um, based on what you are teaching or what you're trying to do. And there's so many educators there that can answer your questions. Um, so that was one main focus. And I just wanted to also um, just give a small shout out to you know my district for, we got back in right at Thanksgiving K-12 um, to in-person full um, you know, instruction. Uh, and it, it made such a big difference uh, to hear the excitement for the art, the explosion of ideas, and to see the process of discovery again in person. Um, although we're maintaining the social distancing and the sanitization, um, to be able to give kids individual tools and give them feedback in person, I wouldn't change a thing. I know it's been really difficult, but... Um, it really has been amazing to see the students every day and have a little bit of normalcy back in the art room. So I really appreciate that we were able to get our act together and get back so quickly. So I know it's not the same for most other people um, around the islands, but you know, I, I, it was amazing. And I hope everybody can get to that point soon. So um, that's, that's my little spiel. So thank you for you know, everything having us tonight. This is really amazing. That's so encouraging to hear, Dina, because I was thinking earlier how um, heartbreaking it is that the children can't enter the art classroom. It's a really special place for a lot of children, and we know that the time making art and in the art classroom is really beneficial to them. We're all art educators, so we believe that, and um, decades of research supports that. It'll be very interesting to see um, the role of art in education um, when researchers look at this particular year, I really believe it's enhanced um, and is important to students' well-being. Um, Heather or Robin, did you have anything you wanted to add in closing about um, technology, the technology you're using? Heather, you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, I will say that Google Classroom has, has been a good organizational tool and um, as mentioned before, it's a wonderful way to uh, archive um, lessons and archive um, the structure and the continuity of the class. Um, some teachers are looking forward to never having to do a Google Meet again. <laughs> um, but uh, for the most part, um, it is interesting. And one of the things I, I did notice is that with the, with the structure of Google classroom, there is an opportunity to have probably more in-depth one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with students about their work. Um, and, and they have a record of it. If you might give some input on a student's uh, work in a uh, private response to something that they submit. Um, so that's something that's really strong. Some of our teachers have been super creative in how they uh, position their laptop <laughs> and kind of making ad hoc document cameras. Others have document cameras, so we've been doing that. Um, but the underlying thing that I would also like to end on too, uh, from, from my point and um, on behalf of my colleagues is how we, as teachers, um, regardless of the subject, re realize how important art education is 
as a uh, healing component for the social emotional well being of students. And um, we're also fortunate in that um, the people that support us, the, our administration recognizes that as well. And that's another reason why these kind of events, um, virtual and uh, our virtual discussions and these exhibits are really important to emphasize the relevance of arts and arts education. Robin, did you want to add something? Um, I, I really, I really agree so much with what Heather has said about the Google Classroom, and and um, I'm grateful for the organizational tools that it's given us. And I'm also, you know, I'm I'm a little tired of working on it. On the other hand, but I I do feel like it's it's really it's a tool that um that we've had to learn to to use and we have we've had to learn to use it in many ways and, and that's bound to be valuable and it's great for organization i do believe but I, I i also feel that um getting the students back in the classroom is 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 the most important thing that we can do with all safety in mind of course and um there's no question that there's been a huge difference. We also had our students come back after Thanksgiving um, and not all of them came back, but they came back on a hybrid schedule. So um, there's just, uh, I don't, I feel that nobody gets lost once they come back into the school on a regular basis. And um, it's just really comforting for the students, I think, and it shows in their work and, um, we just have to keep advocating for the power of arts education because, you know, our programs that challenge challenge all of our students to think about what they have to say to the world and um, express themselves, and um, that's a really important part of a of, of a beautiful life. That's a beautiful note to conclude on, and um, I want to thank all of you. Um, panelists for um, sharing more about the artwork and what's going on in your um, school buildings this year. And I want to thank the, um, well, there are more than 30 schools in total and dozens of art teachers who contributed to the exhibition, and really hundreds of students um, without whom the exhibition's not possible. So for everyone who joined us um, for this panel, please come see the exhibit either in person or um, at home through the tour. And I hope you enjoyed the talk and that we'll see you soon. Thank you all.